All right, everybody, thanks for coming. This is the Beginner's Guide to ICS, How to Never Sleep Soundly Again, with Daniel Brugier. Dan is the Senior Security Consultant at SecurityCon LLC, providing ICS and SCADA clients with customized security assessments that combine traditional vulnerability assessment with controlled penetration testing. Dan has over 14 years of combined experience in both government and commercial sectors as a contractor for the Department of Defense, an analyst in the National Security Agency's TAO office, and other roles with intelligence community partners, businesses, and local governments. Please welcome Dan to ShellCon 2018. Thank you. All right. I always hate to hear the bio at the first, because you're just like, like, stop talking about me. Anyway, all right. So, let's kick this off. Uh, basic intro slide. Yeah, we're, we're going to go through this. And part of it will be dry, I promise. But the reward is that you get to get the story time at the end. So, just hang with me, all right? Okay, so, who am I? As the intro stated, last name is Bougere. I always like to get that out of the way first because I have gotten every single variation possible. Um, some that add extra letters to a French name, so for some reason. Um, it's 15 years in IT now, I haven't updated that. Uh, 12 spent in various security roles from systems administration, network administration, log monkey, to senior security consultant now. Um, previous I mentioned, spent time in the intelligence community on both sides of the river doing fun things. Fun for me, maybe not so fun for the people we were doing them to. Um, and as I mentioned, we, I work at Securicon now. Uh, if you need help, we can help you, Securicon. All right. So how did I even start getting into this? Um, I left college in 2003, and I took a job in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. And on my commute, to certain buildings across the river, I would pass the various chemical plants, refineries, pumping stations, and everything else along River Road. Um, as you can see on the picture on the right, the only thing that's separating a car going 55 miles per hour straight into a fractionating column is that wonderful chain link fence with green plastic across. Um, and this was like right after a curve. So I always would drive by and sometimes in traffic and would sit there and look at this and go, how is this safe? How, how did the people who built this think that this was a bright idea to put all of this right next to a road? Then I kind of got another job, so I didn't worry about it anymore. So how did I get back into it? Um, so I um, parlayed a few things, went to a few startups, decided the startup culture is not for me. It's for you, awesome. You can make a lot of money, not for me. Um, and when I started my job, one of the things that attracted me to my company was the fact that we do ICS SCADA work. And I was like, awesome, that sounds cool. I haven't been involved in that before. And I asked my boss at the time, uh, still my boss, actually, um, do you have any white papers or like, official SecureCon documentation for like an introduction to ICS stuff. Um, no, the answer was no, we have nothing. Here are the NIST guides, here are the protocol things, here's a couple of other things that a few other people have written. By the way, if you have trouble sleeping, I highly recommend the NIST guide to securing ICS systems. It's fascinating reading, utterly fascinating. Um, and so I decided, hey, if I've got to learn this, I'll hopefully do somebody else a favor in the future, and they don't have to worry about reading a NIST guide. So we're going to get over that intro and start with ICS. What exactly are we talking about? Um, any system designed to allow maximal control over a complex environment. Um, I'm not going to read the slide to you. Basically, it's designed to take humans out of situations where they could either be dangerous, cannot react fast enough, or can't just be there. Um, you'll find these systems on the bottom of the ocean. You'll find these systems next to highly toxic environments. You'll find these systems inside of barrels of chemicals that will dissolve a human body if it falls into it. 
that's designed, like I said, to take humans out of these types of situations, which also poses a problem when we have to secure them, because how do you secure a device you can't touch? They also take measurements. Proportional, integral, derivative, various types of mathematical amounts, velocity, any type of system that, any type of measurement that would be useful in a process or a measurement or anything like that would be these types of things. Uh, binary and analog, everyone's relatively familiar with that. Hopefully, if you're here at a hacker conference, you understand the difference between binary and analog. If not, raise your hand. No? Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, that's basically that. Uh, the different types of processes that we get into. Uh, discrete, widgets, license plates, different types of things like that. Pretty much input comes in, magic happens, output goes out, and you're left with this. Batch processes, yeah. Basically, you use this to make drugs, to make food, to make anything that you would normally have a set amount of input done, and then you have results from it. Continuous is kind of where we start getting into water treatment, into power generation, into you know general types of things that require continuous output or input into the process. Um, these can tend to be a little bit more of the scarier ones just because catastrophic failure is bad in these types of environments. Like if you have a nuke plant, you don't want it to melt down. So your systems have to be able to respond to and handle, you know, radiation, fuel outage, water temperature, a lot of different things that, we all, that you all have to maintain and measure while this is going on constantly. And then you're fighting the point of no one really cares about security or IT or OT as long as the electrons flow. That's all they care about. So when you have issues with the security equipment, the problem you run into is the fact that, oh, well, we have to take it offline. Well, that's not going to happen because it takes a week to spin back up. And finally, you have a hybrid system. Um, air traffic control is the best example of this. Um, you have regional airports feeding into main airports. You have main air, uh, air routes across the country. You have constant collisions you have to watch out for. All of this is basically what a hybrid system is. This can expand out, it can contract in. All depends on the type of environment, weather, different things like that. And then we have the general categories of systems. Uh, most people are familiar with the DC distributed controller or SCADA. That's the primary one you see around. Uh, PCS, uh, you'll see it in like food production, chemical production, things like that, where there's a set process to monitor through. Uh, energy management and building management. H think HVAC. Think power manager, power managing, adjusting the temperature up, adjusting the temperature down, things like that. And then safety instrument systems, these are your cutoffs. These are your um, feed dumpener, dampers. These are your flushing systems, different things like that. They're designed entirely to make sure that if the system it is protecting gets out of whack in any way, it fails open or fails closed, depending on the type, and you're done. So how many people here have worked with SCADA systems before? A few? It's just like IT, right? Yeah, you're laughing. Everybody who's worked with it is laughing, of course. It's just like IT. At least that's what everybody who hasn't worked with OT or uh, SCADA systems thinks. It's computers, it's networking, it's the same thing, right? How many people here have worked in regular IT? Yeah, everybody else. How hard is it to buy a network device? Trivial, right? Plenty to choose from, multiple vendors, different types of price points, everything you think, everything you could possibly want. Same thing for workstations, right? Network equipment, you can pretty much go on Newegg and buy whatever you want to stand up a network and do whatever you need to in a regular IT environment. Huh? 
Uh, well, I mean, tiger track, whatever. yeah, tiger right? <laughs> Friggin' the, the Los Angeles County school system, okay. <laughs> that works too. All right, now. There we go. All right. Um, for OT or ICS, you really only have a few things. You only have the HMI or the workstation. Data historian, which keeps track of all the data that's been going on throughout the system, and so we can do comparison to measurements going back and for going backwards and past, and possibly using it to predict future environments as well. Uh, various controls, control amounts, control servers, things like that, where you know it can, fails open, fails close, PLCs, all these different types of things. Same thing with OT, we talked about the workstation. Engineering stations are usually designed more for the controlling of the environment, um, whereas the HMI is designed more for monitoring. Um, and then the PLC is also, they're starting to blend more from their traditional role of just having a, a discrete job. PLCs are becoming more robust to be able to do a variety of things if you're willing to pay for it. That's usually the price point. Same thing with the network equipment, PLC, you know, RTUs, telemetry unit. All of this is basically getting to the point of saying that OT and ICS technology is similar to IT, but it's dissimilar enough to where it is, to be honest, a kind of a pain in the ass to work with. Um, some of it's older, some of it's really very limited in scope. Uh, as opposed to magic boxes that you can go out and buy for the latest IT network. This, you're kind of left with not a lot. And then you get to the different OSs. Everyone's familiar with Windows, Linux, Mac OS. Relatively easy to pick up, patch, update, theoretically. Um, then you've got Office, antivirus and HIDs. A lot of stuff that is normally designed to protect IT, IT networks in these systems. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no McAfee for a real-time operating system. There's no host intrusion system for this. Basically, you're dealing with BusyBox on devices, and even then, that's a stripped-down BusyBox. Uh, if anything happens, they fail. Like, not, not gracefully, no, they just shut down, and they're done. And then you have to dispatch someone out to the middle of nowhere to go figure out why the box isn't working anymore. Um, maintenance agreements basically tell you you can't touch the equipment unless you work for the vendor. A lot of the times, what we'll end up seeing when we go out on engagement is boxes that are still running Windows XP or NT because the vendor says, nope, you can't patch it until we've tested the patch. How many people here rely on vendors to do their patching for them? Like the operating system vendor. None? Can you imagine doing that? Relying on a vendor to do your patching for you? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? <laughs> okay, which vendor would you trust, sir? <laughs> Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and so the, the popular versions that we have are QNIX, VXWorks, and even Windows CE. Um, Microsoft decided to play in this space, and everyone is aware of the blue-screened ATMs or the blue-screened you know, walls and stuff like that. Supposedly, they've really kind of hardened it for the certain types of ICS environments. I still giggle whenever I walk by the LAX and there's a yet another blue screen terminal because, wow, great, great job, guys. Um, everyone's familiar with the protocols. You know, TCP, IP, SSH. Um, security is built into a lot of these protocols, like encryption's automatic, like a quick protocol that Google put out does its own encryption without anything in providing a certificate or anything like that. 
you'll see these pretty much everywhere. And as IT technology evolves, you're constantly seeing this updated. You're constantly seeing, constantly seeing new ciphers as older ones get broken. Nobody really cares if a couple packets get lost on your, on your VoIP call. Nobody really cares if you know, you're watching a YouTube video and you lose a couple packets here and there. It just stutters and it keeps going. Not so much with OT protocols. Um, these protocols were designed when the internet was still connected to three universities. Uh, and back then, nobody ever would have thought that somebody think, would even think it was funny, much less malicious, to attack at a network based on a protocol itself. Uh, some people approached it as simple design. I like to say Modbus is the window licking uh, OT protocol in the world because it literally has four things to work with and does everything else with that. It's amazingly complex for such a ridiculously simple protocol because of all the ways that they've possibly implemented those four ways. Um, essentially what you'll see with uh, Modbus is more of a hub and spoke type of thing. The master is the hub, broadcasts out to all the slaves, tells me, hey, what's going, you know, send me your value, slaves respond back. Slaves usually don't respond until the master tells them to. DMP3 went to the other side of the spectrum and basically gave you anything and everything you could ever possibly want in a protocol. Again, some people think that that's the best way to handle it. Some people would prefer the simplicity of it. Um, DMP3 is usually what the protocol is used for power generation. Uh, you'll see that a lot, especially on uh, transmission sites or transformers. A lot of the radio pa packet radio stuff you'll see is carrying DMP3 traffic. Hopefully encrypted, not always. So for any of the software radio aficionados out there, Go look, at, go look at transformers and watch the DMP3 protocols go by. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with the details of this. If you're really interested, there's the DMP3 primer on the bottom. Um, a lot of these can be encapsulated. DMP3 can be encapsulated with GPRS, Wi-Fi, software radio that I mentioned earlier. Um, that's if the equipment handles it. Some equipment, <laughs> We actually have a client that we work with that has the original equipment that they installed in their network in 1912. I am not joking. They have equipment from 1912, vacuum tubes and all, still installed, running their, running their equipment. Unfortunately, I have an NDA because I would love to be able to share that story with the pictures, but they tend to not want you know, people knowing that they're running equipment from 1912. Um, it's nowhere in here. It's nowhere in California, I can tell you that much. Um, but that goes to the point of how would you get a piece of equipment from 1912 to talk on a network? Can you imagine, has anyone seen that picture of like the 15 adapter like plug that they plug into the back of like a parallel port into a computer? It looks like that. I am not joking. It is ridiculous. But it works for some strange reason, and they just, it's not broke, why, why fix it? It's working. Because the vacuum tubes cost more than the entire thing would be to replace, but you know, hey, it's working. Sure. Um, and another thing is, is bad people understand these protocols. Like, I mentioned software radio. People understand how software radio works. So if you're not, encapsul if you're not encrypting your DMP3 traffic, they can just replay it and do whatever the hell they want with it. You know, if you're not authenticating the actual traffic, if you don't have a method to make sure that the traffic that you think is secure actually is secure, people will crack it open like a kitten in a shark tank. And this is the part where the vast majority of differences are noticed. Uh, the focus. So IT, how many people actually work for technology companies? Yeah. The technology is your product, right? Like, you actually will spend money on your technology to develop your product, right? Of course, that's your business. 
Nonprofits can still be about making money depending on the nonprofit and status of it. Um, they're more interested in getting the message out. They don't really particularly care if they haven't patched their 2003 server because all it does is send email and who would hack an email server? Um, and for anybody who's CISSP, come on, you can admit you've got it. All right, I have it too, I, it's all right, yeah. Um, confidentiality is stressed over integrity or availability. Uh, yeah, OT focus, as long as the bits flow, no one cares. Don't care if we get hacked, as long as we don't have to notify, don't care if we have to, don't care if we have to secure something unless we're specifically told by government regulations to do it. As long as whatever we sell keeps going, that's all we care about. Any dangerous processes are conducted as safely as possible. Again, that comes mostly from government regulation more than from the kindness of the business, kindness of the heart of the business. Um, and it's usually also done as efficiently as possible to make sure that you're not wasting any inputs or that you're wasting any time. Um, for OT, availability is stressed more over integrity and confidentiality. Uh, missing a packet in an OT environment can cause your network to shut down. It can cause your entire thing to fail open. It can cause catastrophic damage in the environment or to yourself. It's important. Uh, and then downtime. SLA is for critical systems and processes. It's five nines, what is it, like six or seven nines or something like that, that people have SLAs with if they're willing to spend the money. Um, unplanned outages are bad, kinda. Like, people have dealt with DDoSs of dying and everything else, and nobody can get to Facebook for a day. You'll bitch about it on Instagram, but life goes on. Not necessarily with this. Um, when you're taking down a generator plant, you plan that because you're gonna be down for a week, a month, doing what you need to do. Uh, and then if you've got a hurricane coming, your planned outage is not going to happen because, well, a hurricane's coming, we have more important things to worry about. Uh, when they're unplanned, is where people go bankrupt, or people die, or you have a smoking crater in the ground where your plant used to exist. Um, kind of like the West Texas fertilizer one, I think, is the one that blew up like half of a freaking kiloton or something like that. Uh, generate white paper, some people will eventually write dissertations on it. Your name will be dragged through the mud, and you don't want that to happen. Um, kind of touched on this earlier as far as procurement goes. Um, depending on the regulation, it will de depend on your procurement. If you're subject to NERC SIP, you have very specific guidelines over how your equipment needs to be purchased and set up and put into your network. Um, if you're more of a HIPAA, PCI type person, as long as they're compliant with that, nobody really cares. Um, you have some ability to tweak and fine tune and patch and yank stuff out and put stuff in to your heart's content. Uh, not so much with ICS and OT. Uh, there's like a handful of vendors for this equipment and they all collude with each other to make sure that they don't interoperate. So if you buy Emerson, you're an Emerson shop. If you buy Hitachi, you're a Hitachi shop. If you buy Siemens, you're a Siemens shop. With the encapsulation of the protocols, you have a little bit of fluidity, fluidity with that now, but not necessarily as much as you would appreciate. Um, kind of mentioned NERC SIP earlier. You also have USDA, FDA regulations. Um, you can maybe tweak a few things, add a box here, take a box out there, if you do it for within the service level agreements with your vendor. Um, and honestly, uh, like a perfect example of this, one of our clients not too long ago um, asked us to come in and to test the system. And we had all set it up, got everything ready to go for the morning coming in. When we showed up in the morning, they told us we couldn't do it. And we're going, what, what did we do? We, we were fine before. 
Um, they contacted the vendor to make sure that the vendor was okay with us testing it. The vendor is basically had kittens and was said, no, 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 you can't do that. You'll bring down your network. And when, to which we responded with, well, not really. I mean, we're just doing some scanning. No, 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 like you'll, you'll crash our devices. We haven't patched that yet. Well, how long have you known about it? About a decade. Yeah. Hence the bigger fish to fry. They don't particularly care. Siemens patched their equipment after Stuxnet, though. It was amazing how quick that happened. What happens when an international incident makes the news, you tend to force the vendor to patch their equipment. Uh, security, we're all here. We're at a hacker conference. We all generally know how security works for the IT environments. <sighs> Y'all, I want to cry sometimes. I, I'm not joking. Like sometimes I go back to the hotel and I'm like, wh why, what, why? Why? It, some of them are just non-existent. Like Telnet. Telnet's exposed on the internet. Well, no, it's not. Well, yes, it is because your box is dual homed into your IT network and it hasn't been patched either. So when your VPN credential hops in, somebody is directly on your internet, from your internet connection directly to the box, then they hop on this box and then they're in your operational network. Maybe Telnet's not a good idea, but it works. Yeah, well, so does sandpapering off a tattoo, but nobody does that. Uh, Many networks, they just don't do security. They don't patch, they don't upgrade their network equipment, they don't do firmware upgrades, they don't do anything. The, the issue that a lot of people run into with this is the people who run these networks come from tele, telecommunications or come from compliance or come from areas that are not necessarily intimately familiar with cybersecurity and security in, in general. So when you're trying to explain to an old phone comms guy that having port 445 exposed on the internet is generally a bad idea. He, A, you need to explain what a port is. B, you need to explain why 445 is important. C, you need to also explain what a worm is. And D, you hope that he just doesn't blow you off and tell you to go away. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, it's a very frustrating as a security professional to come to these environments and basically be told that your entire job is pointless because it works. Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, and again, you saw how many people raised their hands and just, just this room alone, there was what, three, four people that worked with ICS equipment? How many people have even seen what a Siemens controller looks like? Could you recognize it in a room? IoT part, the, the IoT stuff is making that easier now. But like a Siemens S7, would anybody know what the hell that looks like? You should, that's what it was involved in Stuxnet. But yeah, like nobody even knows what this equipment looks like, much able to how to pen test it or secure it. Ah, oh, this didn't work. Okay, this is the feigning goat picture. It's famous for, it, it like almost is required in every single ICS one because literally when you scan a PLC, it falls over like a fainting goat. Okay, so we've kind of gone into the dry bits of all of this stuff and I apologize for it. I see a few of you kind of nodding your heads. So that's, that's fine. Um, here's why this is all scary. Anybody remember this? Has anybody read the white paper on all of this? Yeah, you, Russia screwed over Ukraine with this. Like seriously, they, they, kudos to Russia. I'm sorry, it wasn't Russia. Kudos to the state-sponsored attacker who took down the Ukraine power grid in the middle of December. <sighs> yeah. um, I always love like reading the after action report from these types of things because of course they got in with spear phishing. Of course. Somebody clicked on a spear phishing email, they got black energy inside of the original IT network. Oh yeah, no, I love spear phishing. It's awesome. 
I go on, hop on Facebook and be like, oh, you like puppies. I have an ad for a puppy. Here, click here. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really, they, scary how some people will click on it. Even dumb stuff. The best one I've seen so far, the big red button that says, don't click me. <laughs> You're laughing. People click it. They will literally go, you can't tell me what to do. Click. And I'm like, seriously? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Or that Donald Trump is in jail. Click here. Yeah. Um, once they started, once they got command control, they started, you know, doing the normal hacker thing, swiping that everything wasn't nailed down, found VPNs into the network. Of course they did, because they're always on. Uh, here's the part where it starts getting really bad. Found engineering and process servers on the SCADA network. Don't dual home devices on your OT network and your IT network. If you work in SCADA here, and you work for any type of plant, I swear to God, if I come to your work and there's a dual home device, I'm gonna look at you like you've sprouted a third head and ask you what your major malfunction is. You laugh, every client engagement, I find dual home boxes. They're not supposed to happen because of Nick Serp. Nick, Nurk Sip, sorry about that. Every time I find a dual home box, at least one. Can anybody tell me what a good reason would be to have a dual home box on these two types of networks? That's one. That's two. Come on. Eh, two and a half. Um, yeah. Uh, no one's no one's got the the best answer out of all of them. Okay. Two and three quarters. It's always been that way. What do you say? You're, new, you're a fresh paced person coming into this wonderful new IT network, and you're like, why is this box dual homed, oh mighty supervisor? And what do they respond with? I don't know. Always been that way. There's probably a reason don't change it. Is it documented? <laughs> Who documents their network? Is it patched? We don't have time to patch. Well, how about I unplug it and see who calls? No, don't do that. Yep. Russians did. They said, ooh, that looks like a nice little target. We're just going to sit here for a little while. And they load and observe for like six months. By the way, how do you catch people after they've been in your network after six months? Oh, hunting, yes, yes, my favorite, threat hunting. Mm -hmm. With what? Well, you can find a way in and out, but find them Do you have logs from six months ago? You're right, you're right, it's entirely right. Does your organization have logs from six months ago? Oh, I already did, so I found some of those logs. Oh, okay. Well, that's an improvement then. Most of the time, a client will keep logs for a month. Really good ones will keep it for three. These people laid low for six months. Yeah. Uh, so they disconnected all the substation and caused a major rack. Now, if you really don't like your target, you just turn off and be like, yep, done. We did a good job. Not for the Russians. Um, they decided that they were going to brick the UPS at the central office. So when the power went out, the central office went out. Because how are you going to respond if you can't even mi maintain your systems? It's easy. Um, oh, by the way, they also installed malware into the media converters that brick the devices across the entire network. So like your Fiber to Ethernet, gone. Your DNP3 serial to Ethernet, gone. Wireless to whatever, Ethernet, gone. Everything. Just literally had to go out, hands touch boxes, and replace it. 
Oh, and they also DDoS the call center too. Yeah, this, this was just bad, horrible. So, having said that, this was probably the worst example that I can probably think of in, in recent history of you know, things going on, and this was in Ukraine. Everyone knows Ukraine is still a relatively developing country. I say that, they, they're really not. They're, they're a European country, but they have Russia to the, as a neighbor, so they have issues. Um, but that doesn't happen here, right? Like, nobody really remembers much anything happening here, a few things here or there. Really? Yeah, good, I got a couple chuckles. All right, good. Uh, yeah. How about screwing up the chemical mix in a drinking water? This is 2016, not too long ago. Uh, SQL injection and fishing. How many people have robust fishing protections at their place of work? How many people actually train their users for fishing? Yeah, I see like three hands. Shame on you all, okay? Please make my job harder. I, I, want, I want a challenge. Please make my job harder. Sending a phishing email is basically shooting a fish in like a fish market, not even in a barrel. Because some, because Nancy in accounting is going to click it, okay? The CEO is going to click it. Someone will, someone will click the big red button that says don't click me. I can assure you of that and then I'm in. Or anybody else is in. Or Boris from Bratislava is in. All right, so we do it. I give you my card at the end of it. Then you're not having the proper motivations for your workforce. I guarantee you a wall of shame can go a long way in making sure your users pay attention to their phishing, phishing training, especially if their manager has to go to them with it. Do that twice and make your manager have to take time out of your day to go to an hour long training on what not to click on dumb emails. See how long you keep that job. <laughs> All right, so that's water treatment. This is my, one of my favorite ones. They literally captured the commands being given to this during a test one time, saw the DMP3 traffic and then replayed it everywhere in the entire city of Dallas for how long was it? I think it was like a couple of hours of nothing but tornado sirens going off for hours before they could figure out what was going wrong. Not life-threatening, but damn sure annoying, you know? And would you like to be that emergency management manager? Yeah. Okay, so two recent stories about this types of issues. Um, we had a utility client who asked us to come in and test their network. And we're like, awesome, great, okay. Utility client decided, look, we want you to come into our power plant and we want you to test our equipment for real. Not playing around, we want you to come in and test it for real. If you knock it over, fine. We will give you a get out of jail letter if you knock over a power plant. My coworker and I are like, yes, finally we get to kill a power plant. Because we knew we were gonna kill it. We knew it, like that's going to happen. We will find a way. So we set up and we get told by the network manager at the power plant, you're not gonna be able to get into a network. Well, challenge accepted, of course. So we're like, all right, well look, um, where's your switch? Doesn't matter, look, I'll walk in there, I'll plug it in myself, you're not gonna get on the network. Are you, are you running 802.1x? What's that? The plot thickens, okay. So co-work and I walk up, we plug in, fire up Wireshark, and we see packets. And we're like, we thought we couldn't get on the network. Well, yeah, you're not on the network. I see packets. Well, yeah, I mean, you're gonna see packets, but that doesn't mean you're on the network. What does being on the network mean to you? 
Well, you don't have an IP address. Uh, okay, sure, no problem. Okay, I've got an IP address. You're on our network. <laughs> Were you not aware that I can manually assign an IP address to my box and participate in your network? Like, I can even VLAN tag it if you want. Well, we don't have VLANs. Of course you don't have VLANs. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, I'm not gonna go make a phone call real quick. I'll be right back. All right, whatever, dude. Call him, stuff like that. He's like, uh, yeah, okay, look, you know, I know y'all supposed to start scanning stuff like that. You know, it's kind of late. Let's, you know, let's hold off on that tomorrow. We're like, okay, we'll just capture a couple more packets and then, you know, we'll go. So we were supposed to arrive at 8.30. The <laughs> board of directors had a meeting at 7. And all of a sudden, the client who was Billy Badass, you can knock over our network. We don't care. We'll take care of it. Is like, now hold up. Wait, wait, hold on. Let, let's, let's not be too hasty with this. Um, come to find out, they thought that because they didn't have a DHCP server running on their network, that that meant that, I couldn't, that we couldn't get on their network and do all the fun scanning stuff because they just thought that if they just plugged up, yeah, you'd just see packets, but you couldn't send any traffic on there. So of course, yeah, sure, knock yourself out, dude. You're not gonna get on there. When we could, and they were already doing maintenance on one generator. They were not really willing in it to knock over the other one and be completely down for the two weeks it would take to stand it back up because according to their vendor, had we done what we wanted to do, it would have caused a catastrophic hard fail and they would have to come and manually reset all of their equipment. Because I enjoy like having my paycheck. <laughs> and I also enjoy not being in jail. Because that, yeah, yeah, they rescinded that letter, of da letter out, let me tell you. But that's the thing. Like, these are the people who are securing these networks. Oh, and by, by the way, this is the best part. Um, as we were leaving, there was nobody at the front desk. As we drove in the morning, there was nobody at the gate. The cabinet was helpfully labeled with like OT switch and it wasn't locked. Can anybody else see this wonderful situation that's going on in my head where somebody drives up, walks in, plugs into their equipment, gives it an IP address and takes down an entire generating plant for a major state? All because they thought they were secure that they didn't have a DHCP server. It's funny to us, because we understand this, but for them, they don't. They think they're secure. They're not. This, this year. Yeah, yeah May. May, May, June time frame. Um, yeah, so second story time. Um, don't, lie to your don't lie to your consultants. If you hire a pen testing firm, do not lie to the people coming to do your pen testing. It never ends well, especially if it's me because I know my luck. <laughs> uh, relatively recent, um, we were scanning a network and uh, we're like, okay, look, you know, last year we did this for you and we asked um, if you had any particularly sensitive equipment on your network. Um, please let us know. We'll be sure to handle it very gently and or just not scan it. All the equipment's been removed. You answered very quickly for someone who just finished telling me they don't really have any network documentation. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm confident. We, we, we yanked all of that last year. Are you sure? Yeah, it's entirely gone. Your network, dude, you know it. Okay, great. So plug up, do everything we need to do wait two hours for someone to assign a VLAN on the port we're on. And then we're like, okay, great. So let's start throttling down in math to where it only sends, no retries, only scans one box going through, doesn't parallel, doesn't do anything like that. Like I'm setting up to be watching and map crawl across this network. 
I am ready for this. I have brought books. I have other work to do. Yeah. Uh, about 15 minutes into scanning, we're like, hey, guys, uh, what are y'all doing? We're, we're scanning, like we told you to, we're going to do. Yeah, the operators are seeing some really weird stuff. Can you stop it? Define weird stuff. Yeah, they're like they're not getting really they're not getting good telemetry. Like things are messing up. Like alarms come on and then they fade off. And the, yeah, it's just like a really weird stuff going on. Can you can you can you stop scanning and see if it clears up? All right, so we stop scanning and it clears up. Okay, move on to the next network. No big deal. Except for a week and a half later, when the direct grand high poobah of OT, I don't remember the dude's title now, um, basically called us under the carpet for crashing one of their generators. And we're like, what do you mean one of your generators crashed? Like, we left that site. There was nothing wrong with the equipment. Like, everything worked. Like, your operators told us that it came back with no problems. No, you crashed our generator. What does the word crash your generator mean to you? Please explain to me. Well, so they have five generators. Four of them failed gracefully. One of them did not. And fried approximately four or five different pieces on it that had to go and be manually replaced out in the middle of nowhere. And this is, of course, our fault for some reason. I don't know why. Anyway, um, so we're like, okay, uh, well, what exactly happened? Well, when you were scanning, the PLCs on that network didn't respond appropriately. Wait, whoa, 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 stop. What do you mean the PLCs on that network? Yeah, we had PLCs on the net that network. So remember when we asked you <laughs> if you had any sensitive equipment on that network? Yeah. Were you lying? Well, no, we just didn't know about it. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, we just didn't know about it. We, we, we forgot about it. You, you forgot about major equipment that ensures the safety of the product that you produce for major metropolitan areas. You, you just forgot that there's equipment on there responsible for maintaining the health and safety of that product. Well, yeah, we're, we're, we're still working on our documentation. The documentation you gave me is a decade old. Yeah, we're still working on it. Okay, great. And those are just two stories. And now you know why this is called How to Never Sleep Soundly Again. We're in the major port down there, right? Can you imagine the type of nasty stuff that comes through that port every single day? We have radiological monitors down there, don't we? Biological monitors, chemical monitors. How many chemical plants are around this area? How many waste treatment plants are around this area that store ozone in, co in toxic levels? How many people buy medicines, generics? You trust that those systems are maintained with health and safety, right? That random like glass shards don't get put in pills or that you're actually getting the chemicals in the right amounts that they say they are? The people who are maintaining those networks think you can't get on the network because they don't have a DHCP server. So, if you work in an environment like this, or you know people who do, please tell them that security is important and that there are people out there that is willing to help them with it. If you are participating in any type of scanning or if you see a Telnet server on the internet or if you're just running Shodan and you see a PLC controller that's responding to Telnet, please report that and tell the company there who's running it, who's responsible. There's also specific pen testing suites available that concentrate on this type of thing. Samurai is one of them. Um, NMAP 
has a few things. They need help. Uh, Metasploit auxiliary scanners are also getting pretty well um, in this area. Uh, and finally, call my company. We do this. We're willing to help. And I promise I won't tell the stories from that company up here again. And the contact me slide. So, any questions? Wow, really, I scared everybody that bad. Okay, awesome. <laughs> yes? Is regulation missing? Is, is people need to be trained? What's the way forward? All of you. <laughs> um, depending on the industry, there are certain, there are certain um, agencies and bodies of um, regulations, I guess would be the best way to describe it, um, that are responsible for maintaining that. Uh, NERC SIP is a good one. Uh, there's another type of one for power plants, for um, chemicals, usually FDA. Food usually falls under the uh, USDA. So depending on the industry, one specifically that should have regulation that doesn't, water treatment. There is no body of federal regulation uh, that regulates water treatment plants. They are voluntarily doing their best. Right. Uh, I believe you had a question, sir? Just the, you know, the, the company I work at, I know for sure that there are old systems like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm still kind of new. But as far as trying to find these systems uh, yeah. on your network, are, it sounds like just scanning that you knock everything over. Yes. Carefully. Um, so the first thing we do when we get on site is we listen passively in packet captures to see the type of traffic that flows by. So. If you see like Modbus or DMP3 or something like that, you watch the traffic for 15, 20, an hour, a day to get a general idea of the types of systems that are on your network, what their addresses are, because some may not even have IPs. It could all just be MAC address based. Um, and that way you can kind of map out what's on your network. And then you can kind of start going from there. You'll have a baseline at that point. Yeah, it's. This can be very tedious stuff. Like it's, yeah, it's very sensitive. It's very hands off. You have to, like, there's a reason why we use the fainting goat GIF because it's literally like if you touch it wrong, it falls over and dies. Um, and then hopefully it comes back up fast enough to where nobody notices. So, yes, sir. What do you make of this for your Like, do you mess with Grass Marlin or? Um, map. I mean, we. Yeah, I mean, we, we usually tune it down to where it only scans one box at a time, no retries, um, doesn't delay, uh, like doesn't up the delay on it, um, and like max host group of one. Um, very much a one box focus on that, so if it kicks over, it doesn't bleed over into the rest of the network, and you can isolate it. Um, so that way, you, the issue with SCADA stuff is that if you do it right, you can cause a cascading failure because these networks will have dependencies and if one box goes down and another box is depending on its data, it may send up an alert to saying, hey, I'm not talking to this box. And then if another one goes down, it's like, oh, there's two. And then another one goes down three. Oh, catastrophic network failure, fail closed, flush everything. So it, it's very much a methodical checklist. Okay, we're done with this. Okay, we're done with this type of thing. Yes, sir. Can you go about getting some like practical hands-on experience with this kind of, um, kind of systems? Other than buying the equipment itself, <laughs> um, there are some um, emulators out there. You can find older equipment on eBay sometimes. Uh, there are a lot of packet captures that you can look at as well to see the traffic flowing through. Um, there's been a couple of presentations. Uh, I need to look up the dude's name. I can't remember it offhand. It's the guy who uh, replayed the radio traffic for the transmissions for DMP3. He did a whole, like, I think either DEF CON or Black Hat presentation on it. Uh, there's resources out there. And uh, Samurai uh, is like the metasploit of um, SCADA hacking. 
So it's got a, like, a lot of custom tools in it and things in there. And I haven't really had much of a chance to play with it, but I mean, it's, it's got a lot of different resources for you. Any other questions? Going once. Excellent. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it.